Welcome to our sixth and, for me, final lecture uh, in our Politics and Culture of the Contemporary Middle East uh, course, um, which is on social media in everyday life. Uh, before I jump into the lecture, I want to briefly go over what we've covered so far and to synthesize some of the key threads in our reflection on culture in the Middle East uh, so far. Um, we began with an overview of different approaches to culture and how these approaches have influenced knowledge production in and about uh, the Middle East. Uh, the second lecture gave a brief uh, history of heritage preservation, where you could see how so-called cultural institutions apply different ideas of culture in practice um, and how different groups have different stakes in heritage preservation initiatives. Um, the third lecture gave a brief overview of the history of cinema and television in the Middle East. Um, I've talked about the tension between different state and non-state stakeholders in broadcast media, um, and I've discussed how these media have been instrumentalized to create and maintain a national culture, quote unquote. Um, the fourth lecture gave insight into practices of musical production and consumption across the region, um, but especially in Iran and Turkey. Um, I've explored in particular how music allows us to think uh, differently about the organization of the senses and the constitution of publics. Um, today's lecture explores yet another medium, the internet, um, and specifically social media platforms such as blogging websites, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, although social media emerged in the Middle East at around the same time as everywhere else, roughly in the early 2000s, um, academic interest in the region's social media has exploded after the Arab Spring revolutions of 2011. Um, some of you may be too young to remember this, uh, but in news coverage of these events, um, the revolutions were described as Twitter or Facebook revolutions, um, implying that this unprecedented wave of popular mobilizations was caused by the freeing potential of Western technology um, outside the control of Arab regimes. Um, Anna Alexander and Miriam Aurag um, have shown why this argument is problematic in their article titled uh, The Egyptian Experience, Sense and Nonsense of the Egyptian Revolution, which um, is on your key readings list. Um, they build on Edward Said's argument about Orientalism, uh, basically the idea that the Orient, uh, including the Middle East, is seen as a kind of passive, changeless, homogenous region in Western representations. Um, they build on, on this argument to argue that the news coverage of the Arab Spring was being cyber-orientalist um, in the sense that it assumed that the region was also changeless and couldn't become revolutionary um, without the help of Western technology. Um, Alexander and Aura caution us against the technological determinism inherent in this argument or the notion that the use of certain technologies will automatically and magically lead to certain social outcomes, um, in this case to freedom from autocracy. Um, and in hindsight, these kinds of simplistic takes on the freeing potential of social media have come to look silly after the wave of counter-revolutions across the region, um, where the very technologies that were thought to encourage freedom were now used uh, for mass surveillance and repression. Um, to be clear, I think there is a way to study the impact of social media on mass mobilization without being deterministic. Um, and indeed, I think the best work on the topic uh, situates the mobilizations that have happened online among many factors to explain why people went to the streets um, during the Arab revolutions. Um, however, I've decided not to engage with the scholarship today um, because I believe that it overshadows the broader universe of meaning and practices um, surrounding social media in the Middle East, um, which, like elsewhere, goes well beyond social movements as such. Um, so if you're interested in the specific relationship between media and revolution and mobilization, I could give you additional recommendations for reading. Um, overall, I want you to take two things out of today's lecture. Uh, first, I want you to gain a sense of the diversity of discourses and practices surrounding social media in Egypt specifically. Um, and I've decided to focus on Egypt in the interest of kind of cohesion, uh, but your further readings list uh, contain many more case studies from uh, Palestine, Turkey, the Gulf, and Iran notably. Um, what I want to show today is how social media in the Middle East uh, isn't just like a political tool, uh, but it has many more dimensions, literary ones, uh, religious ones, entertainment ones, etc. Second, uh, I wanted to reflect on the idea of new media, so-called, um, and what it means in practice. In academic writing, the internet has been analyzed as the new medium par excellence. You know, uh, There are countless articles across many disciplines discussing how the internet introduces radical transformations in people's lives and thoughts. Um, as I will argue, however, uh, social media is a great case to illustrate how, uh, to, to talk about how a media's newness, quote unquote, or the internet's revolutionary potential, um, tends to obscure certain historical continuities with other media forms. 
it's important to remember that the internet too has a history, um, which means that it's connected with other media forms and involved in the same kind of cultural politics that I, I've described in the cases of cinema, television, and music in previous weeks. All media seem new, quote unquote, in their own time, um, but the obsession with newness itself is actually quite old. Um, and Walter Armbrust has developed this argument in his article, A History of New Media in the Middle East, which is on your general recommended readings uh, for the course. In today's lecture, I will concentrate on three main cases to illustrate the diversity of everyday uses of social media in Egypt. Um, first, we will discuss blogs using Marwan Kredi's uh, the, Naked, the Naked Blogger of Cairo as a case study. Um, second, we will discuss uh, online Islamic discourse and how youth engage with Islamic content on YouTube uh, through Charles Hershkin's work on the YouTube khutbah or the YouTube sermon. Um, lastly, we will discuss the memosphere in Egypt uh, based on my own work and my own general interest in uh, Egyptian internet comics. So let's start with blogging. Um, the relationship between news media and politics has driven much research into Middle Eastern media from the early 1990s onwards. Um, so it's really no surprise that blogging uh, was among the very first internet phenomena to gain widespread attention in academic writings. Um, the studies uh, that are shown on this slide are just a small sample of this type of work. Um, their approach is generally centered on discourse analysis, um, though there are some quantitative studies of the Arabic or Persian blogosphere as a whole kind of um, in journals such as New Media Society or the International Journal of Communication. Um, but mostly uh, you find analysis of discourse, um, which usually compare blog posts, uh, whether they're written by laymen or professional activists, um, to mainstream press discourse. So there's this comparison between blogging and mainstream press. They situate these discourses within a broader social and political context. Let's say uh, in the case of Ali Reza Duzdar, for example, uh, the Iranian blogging community is situated in a time of economic liberalization in the early 2000s. Um, in the case of Sunah Haqbola's uh, article, uh, Lebanon around the time of the Syrian withdrawal in 2005 is the context for his article about blogs. Um, likewise, for the last two articles, it's the context of Egyptian activists writing around the time of the 2011 revolution. Um, I won't be able to go into much detail in all of these case studies, but they all make one basic point against uh, what we could call techno-optimism, right? Or the position according to which blogs, um, like satellite television or the internet, act as a space where people living under authoritarian regimes can speak freely, as it were, outside of state control. Um, this is also, in a way, extending Anna Alexandra and Miriam Aurag's point uh, from earlier about technological determinism. Uh, the scholarship on Arabic or Persian blogs is clear that writing online won't necessarily affect structural inequalities offline, right? These very inequalities inflect online discourses in important ways um, by allowing, let's say, only certain segments of the population to access the blogosphere or by valuing certain types of online content over others. Um, so basically, it's not because uh, some well-educated citizens write against the government online that it will automatically translate into a mass uprising, uh, which is a little bit the connection that was being made, um, especially in mainstream news coverage. What blogs do, however, um, is expand on the range of available opinions in a conversation that was previously restricted to mainstream uh, media sources, uh, the state-controlled newspapers, state television and private satellite channels, um, public and private radio, and so on. Blogs introduce the thoughts articulated by amateur citizens um, into the conversation, whether they live in the Middle East or abroad, whether they write in English, French, Arabic, or Persian, um, and whether they're male or female. Um, these opinions uh, are inflected by linguistic register, by gender, by political position. So they're not representative of a kind of singular free Arabic or Persian public sphere, right? Um, because the space in which they intervene is much more uneven and fractured. Um, therefore, the so-called new medium uh, of blogging uh, didn't bring revolutionary change on its own, um, but it lies in continuity with an existing space of public discussion constituted through state-controlled and corporation-controlled media, um, and it only kind of expands on this existing space. Marwan Kredi's book, uh, The Naked Blogger of Cairo, which is on your key readings list, examines this space um, after the Arab revolutions in a number of cases across the Arab world. Uh, Kredi uses the concept of creative insurgency, quote-unquote, to describe the types of content he's interested in. Um, so his book is not just about blogs uh, or online videos or graffiti, but about acts of insurgency against autocratic Arab governments uh, more broadly. 
His main argument, in contrast with the kind of discourse-based studies of the blogosphere that I've shown earlier, is that the central medium through which creative insurgency occurs after 2011 is the body. Craigie wants us to think beyond what people talk about online and to look at what bodies do in contentious politics and in mobilizing dissent against autocratic rulers. Um, this pattern is clear enough when you think about Mohamed Bouazizi, uh, whose self-immolation was said to spark the Tunisian uprising in 2011, or Khaled Saeed, who was beaten to death uh, by the Egyptian police in Alexandria and became one of the early uh, martyrs of the Egyptian revolution through the Facebook page uh, called uh, We Are All Khaled Saeed. Or more recently, there is the case of Mohsen Fikri, who was crushed inside a trash truck in November 2016 and sparked a wave of protests uh, across Morocco and especially in the Moroccan Reef. The title of the book, uh, The Naked Blogger of Cairo, refers to yet another form of bodily protest. Uh, which was enacted by the female blogger Alia El Mahdi, um, a liberal feminist activist who published naked pictures of herself on her online blog, uh, A Rebel's Diary, uh, or Era, which could also translate as A Revolutionary's Diary. Um, in October 2011 was when she published her famous uh, naked picture. Um, Al Mahdi's publication provoked quite a stir in Egypt and in the Arab world. Um, condemnations in the press and on social media fused from all sides. Um, from pro-revolution groups arguing that al-Mahdi's naked protest weakened uh, the demands of the secular liberal camp um, against the state and the Islamists, um, all the way to Islamist and pro-regime figures who argued that it demonstrated the straying path on which the youth of the revolution had set. Kredi argues that the body, or uh, the naked female body in this case, sparks both online and offline public discussion. More broadly, uh, Kredi's book is a good illustration of the diversity of online practices in Egypt and across the Arab world. He demonstrates how blogging is not an autonomous medium, uh, but one which engages with a range of online and offline media. Uh, for instance, blogs aren't just long-form columns uh, where citizens debate their political ideas, but they have important visual and embodied dimensions as well, um, as illustrated by uh, A Rebel's Diary. Moreover, uh, blogs are a concrete illustration of how, despite being a new medium, quote-unquote, in the time of their emergence in the 2000s, uh, they were inserted in a wider media ecology with older media, uh, including newspapers and television. Bloggers, in fact, respond to these older media in many ways, and they can use similar written and visual techniques to kind of counter uh, the messages that are given in mainstream uh, media uh, outlets. In a sense, blogs are both old and new media at once, um, so it's important to situate them within their historical context to, to understand what they are actually about. Now I want to move on to a second case study, uh, which is online Islamic discourse. Academic interest and the Internet's influence over Islamic discourse began with a key volume edited by two anthropologists, uh, Dale Eichelman and John Anderson, entitled New Media in the Muslim World. Uh, their project is well summarized in the opening lines uh, to the introduction of the book, quote, A new sense of public is emerging throughout Muslim-majority states and Muslim communities elsewhere. Situated outside formal state control, this distinctly Muslim public sphere exists at the intersections of religious, political, and social life. Facilitated by the proliferation of media in the modern world, the Muslim public can challenge or limit state and conventional religious authorities and contribute to the creation of civil society, end quote. Now, notice that this quote begins with the same discourse about newness that um, I've talked about earlier, uh, which is said to be a kind of consequence in a rather deterministic fashion of new media technologies. Um, there's a claim that these new technologies allow a new, quote-unquote, Muslim public sphere to emerge, which is outside state control and even challenges it. The assumption in Eichelman and Anderson's reading is that um, until the dawn of the Internet age, mass-mediated religious discourse was controlled by nation states. Now, in Egypt, um, this was exemplified by Sheikh al-Sharawi, uh, who uh, would give a sermon or a khutbah in Arabic um, on Egyptian state television every Friday, uh, which is kind of customary across the Muslim world that the preacher leads the Friday prayer and gives a sermon after it. Um, what's interesting in Sharawi's case uh, is how his sermon was not just restricted to the few believers uh, who attended the, uh, the mosque, but it was broadcast and listened to across Egypt and became quite a prominent figure uh, this way. Um, this clip is just one very small example to show you what Sharawi looks like uh, in his sermon. Uh, and here he discusses the difference between uh, sins encouraged by the self and sins encouraged by Satan. <laughs> 
ولذلك تجد هذا هو الفارق بين معصية يوحي بها الشيطان ومعصية تصر عليها النفس عشان ما نظلمش الشيطان في كل حاجة فإذا نفسك حدثتك بمعصية ووقفت عند المعصية ولا تتلحلح عنها فاعلم أنها من النفس لأن النفس تريد المعصية من هذا اللون فقط يمكن واحد ما تقدرش ترشيه بمال الدنيا لكن واحدة بنظرة واحدة فلما يجي الإنسان يلاقي نفسه واقف عند معصية مخصوصة يلحلح نفسه برضه تقول له هي دي بقى دي من النفس لأن النفس تريد صاحبها عاصيا على لون خاص يحقق لها شهوة لكن إبليس ليس كذلك إبليس يريد المؤمن عاصيا على أي شكل من أشكال المعصية فإن عز عليه في باب من أبواب المعصية يترك له إيه بابا آخر من أبواب المعصية Uh, so Shahrawi is known and respected as an incarnation of so-called moderate Islam uh, of the kind promoted by President uh, Hosni Mubarak's state in the 1990s, uh, especially. And the clip I've shown you is interesting in this regard because you can notice some military personnel listening to him. Uh, so his immediate audience is already within the fold of the state in some ways. Um, what you can notice even visually is how Shahrawi incarnates a kind of older model of Islamic authority the expert preacher whose word descends from above onto the believer. The believer in turn accepts his expert authority on Islamic matters by listening to him. Um, and this kind of authority contrasts with the Islamic internet as described by John Anderson in New Media in the Muslim World. Quote, the internet is one of these new media, by some measures a new public space, which enables a new class of interpreters who are facilitated by this medium to address and thereby to reframe Islam's authority and expression for those like themselves and others who come there. A common issue across the range of discussions, positions, and arguments associated with Islamic activism is taking responsibility for interpreting religion in a world of competing voices, multiple authorities, and problematic legitimacies." End quote. What Anderson describes is not just how the internet allows people to talk about religion outside what preachers like Shahrawi say on television, but to question the authority of preachers like Shahrawi by engaging in a range of uh, quote-unquote discussions, positions, and arguments. The idea being that the internet, and in particular web forums, um, open a space for the rational discussion of Islam, a space which was closed by religious institutions under the control of authoritarian states. This space is accessible to any Muslim, uh, regardless of his or her expertise on Islamic matters. Um, so you don't need to spend years memorizing the Qur'an and the Hadith, uh, as Shahrawi has done to speak on Islam, but you can just read the Qur'an and read the Hadith on your own, you can talk about it online. That's the basic idea. Now, I believe it's important to historicize Eichelman and Anderson's claims. Um, both assume that religious messages were initially under state control, and then they, they were freed by new media technologies. This impression of control and liberation is related to a specific historical trajectory between the 1960s and the 1990s, um, between a time where Middle Eastern states successfully imposed their control over uh, so-called acceptable Islamic discourse, and, and this happened earlier in Kamala's Turkey, but the 1960s is a kind of good benchmark across the Arab world, and a, a later time uh, where religious discourse uh, outside state control explodes uh, online and offline. What isn't mentioned is that this trajectory is not one way. Um, throughout the history of Islam, uh, there has been a constant tension between centralized states trying to impose their own interpretations of Islam onto religious practices, which are in effect much more varied in practice. Um, so there's a tension between the kind of centralizing tendencies of the state and the kind of natural decentralization of Islamic practice. Arguably, uh, Muslim-majority states were never all too successful in controlling uh, religious discourse. And in the sense, the period between the 1960s and the 1990s in the Middle East is more the exception than the norm, that the state actually manages to have some control. Um, so the fact that online discussions of Islam escape and challenge state control is not necessarily a unique phenomenon historically. Um, more recent works on Islam online have been more careful in historicizing these issues, um, and they lend a different insight into the impact of the internet on religious discourse. Um, I could give several examples, and I can re recommend more readings on the matter um, if you're interested, but I'll just give one example uh, in the interest of time, which comes from Charles Hershkins' uh, article on YouTube sermons, uh, which is also on your key readings list. 
Pershkin is an anthropologist whose earlier work was on audio cassette sermons in Egypt, and I've mentioned this book, um, The Ethical Soundscape, uh, in last week's lecture. Um, sermons were traditionally restricted to the mosque on Friday, uh, where an entire area of male sociability revolves around listening to the preacher, hanging out with friends, and so on. Um, with radio and later television, um, some sermons began, began being broadcast um, and became a staple of the nationalist discourse on religion, and Sheikh Shahrawi being a prominent case of this. In the 1970s, um, the emergence of audio cassettes allowed sermons to be recorded and sold on the streets of Cairo. So sermons could be listened to at different times and in different places by different preachers, also with very different allegiances, uh, not necessarily in line with the state's official discourse and often in opposition to it. YouTube extended this process, um, as Hirschkin argues in his article, by becoming a platform for what he calls online experiments in ethical affect. Now, that's a mouthful. Uh, these experiments are ethical because the Islamic believer engages in practices of self-improvement um, by trying out different preachers online to see which one nurtures his or her faith better. Um, and here, one should be aware that Hirschkin is interested uh, specifically in hyper-pious subjects, um, not just your kind of run-of-the-mill believer, um, but, um, you know, he's interested in people who bring back all their religious activity to the same goal of trying to better themselves. Um, Hirschkin talks about how these experiments, um, this engagement with online sermons, generates affect, um, which is a complicated concept, but it can be glossed as emotion in this case. Um, and it is precisely this emotional component which lends attraction to the online khutbah, the online sermon, as opposed to the regular one. Um, this quote by one of uh, Charles Hirschkin's interlocutors is instructive in this specific regard. Quote, when I want to hear a khutbah, I go to the mosque on Friday and listen to the khatib, uh, the preacher. The internet gives you something different. Online, you find just the best parts of a sermon, those where the khatib is describing the most amazing scenes, al-Mashahid uh, al-Rahiba, or reciting the most moving verses, al-Ayat Akthar al-Mu'athira. Um, I always find something new and wonderful, ra'a. Uh, so the example of the YouTube khutbah uh, shows you a much different range of content with which people engage online in Egypt, um, and the kind of content that's not often analyzed in relation to the Arab revolutions, but it probably should. Um, it also shows you the continuities uh, between old and new media forms. The internet brings something new to the khutbah, um, this heightened kind of emotional component, um, this ability to edit the pre preacher's words around and, and create a, almost a new um, preaching. But it's also um, in dialogue with the older Friday sermons and the state-controlled broadcasts, either by echoing its themes or by uh, opposing them. And the video of Sheikh Sharawi that I've shown you earlier is precisely an example of how state television content itself becomes remediated online, um, and it's uploaded and engaged with in parallel with many other online sermons, many of which don't really follow um, the state's line. So our third and final case study are internet memes uh, in Egypt. I, I have two articles in English uh, that explore the universe of memes, or comics, as they're called in Arabic, um, one of which is on your suggested readings list. Um, some scholars have written briefly about Egyptian memes as well. Um, Aydel Iskandar is one, um, and Linda Herrera in her book on your suggested readings is another one. Um, but there is, in general, very little scholarship on this specific aspect of online visual culture in the Middle East, um, although it's arguably central to many people's online worlds. Um, I think we need more research to situate memes in people's everyday lives more accurately, um, but I'll tell you about the memosphere mostly based on my experiences as an Egyptian meme consumer, and uh, maybe you'll also get into it eventually. Um, so memes in Egypt come in many varieties. Uh, some are very familiar if you follow kind of global meme trends, um, including memes who use the, the troll face that you see uh, on the left, uh, which is kind of, this meme is written in English, even if it's from a very famous um, comics page called Asahbi. Um, or there's like dirt memes uh, based on a set of kind of simplified archetypal cartoon characters, which are used to make everyday jokes, um, like the one that you see on the right. Uh, now, while these memes kind of follow global trends in meme culture, um, others are a bit more specific to the Egyptian context. Um, the specific genre of memes in which I'm interested can be best thought about as uh, quote-unquote digital caricatures, which is my own term for it. Um, these caricatures are user-generated, but they're curated and published by specialized Facebook or Instagram pages, um, the most popular of which uh, have millions of followers. I've included the names and logos of uh, some of the most famous pages on this slide, um, including Asahbi Sarcasm Society. Asahbi is basically a kind of shabby way of saying, hey, my friend. 
Um, Egypt Sarcasm Society, um, Tam which means subtitle by, and, and this page specializes in funny Egyptian subtitles of American movies and TV series. Fossil Mish Alemi, which means a non commercial break, uh, and there's many more if you're interested, I can tell you about them. Um, Digital caricatures are visually distinct because they heavily rely on a collage of screenshots from films, televised plays, serial dramas, video clips, advertising, um, which are all drawn from Egyptian pop culture. In a way, these memes are an online manifestation of a particular universe of pop culture references that are already part of everyday conversations and jokes and, in fact, pre-exist the memosphere. Um, and this is kind of the pop culture universe that Walter Armbrust uh, was writing about in Mass Culture and Modernism in Egypt, which we read in week four. Now, let me give you two examples uh, from one of my favorite comics pages, uh, which is called Mandoob Tube. Um, it's not the biggest page. It has about like 2.5 million followers on Facebook. Um, Mandoob in Arabic means uh, a representative in general, um, but this page specifically refers to sales representatives. Um, and basically, it makes fun of the difficulties of corporate life in Egypt. Um, the first meme was shared about three years ago. Um, the joke is a common one on Mandoob Tube, um, as well as in everyday jokes among salaried workers uh, more broadly. The lady on top is crying really heavily and asks, where's the salary, mom? Um, and the lady at the bottom replies, the salary was swept away by the plague. Um, the second meme was shared a few weeks ago while I was writing this lecture. Um, and the caption above says, how one feels at the end of the month, um, and the old ragged man cries out, where are you, Egyptian pounds? Um, and the joke in both cases is basically that the salary isn't enough to last the full month. So it's either taken away by the plague, quote unquote, or um, you have to look around for your Egyptian pounds like this man. Um, now, many of you will not recognize that these screenshots actually come from very famous Egyptian movies. Um, this meme is from a black and white melodrama called the uh, Dua El Karawan, or The Nightingale's Prayer, um, which was made in 1959. The actress in the upper hand screenshot is Fetan Hanema, who was like the major movie star in Egyptian cinema during the 1950s and 1960s. And she became especially known in melodramas where she acts out an innocent, jovial, or temperamental girl, little girl, who gets torn by her fate and kind of grows from being a girl to an older woman during the course of the movie. Um, the actress in the bottom uh, screenshot is Amina Riz, uh, a pioneering producer and act uh, actress in the history of Egyptian cinema, uh, who became known later in her career um, as a character actress, often incarnating the role of a mother on screen, um, like in this film. Um, the Ninth Tingle's Prayer is basically about honor and shame in the Egyptian countryside. Um, the film was highly valued by state-affiliated intellectuals and critics um, as an exemplar of, kind of social realism, um, which is considered the most important genre of cinema in high cultural settings in Cairo. Um, so it was regularly shown on state television and in official cultural institutions over the decades. And this scene is a climactic one where Amina, uh, which is Fetan Hanema's character above, um, is lamenting the death of her sister Hanedi uh, at the hands of her jealous husband. This is likely a scene that most Egyptians who watch television will have seen, or if they haven't, they will at least have heard its punchline before, um, which is Hanedi was taken away by the plague, or Hanedi khad al waba. And the meme replaces Hanedi with the salary, al murattab khad al waba. Now, this meme uh, comes from a historical movie called Wa Islame, or, or O Islam, um, which was made in 1962. Um, the story of the movie is a kind of fictionalized account of the rise to power of the first Mameluk sultans in Egypt uh, in the 13th century. Um, this was also a favorite of state-affiliated intellectuals because it extolled the virtues of nationalist resistance by depicting the Mameluks as kind of proto-Egyptian nationalists who repelled the foreign invaders um, who were embodied by the Mongol Empire in this case. Um, this representation is, of course, historically inaccurate insofar as the Mamluks weren't nationalists in the modern sense, um, let alone the many inaccurate details uh, of the story portrayed on screen. But the important thing is that the actor you see here is uh, Hassan Riyad, uh, who's a well-known character actor in Egypt um, and who became known for his roles as a kind of old, wise, father-like figure, especially later in his career. As was the case with the Nightingale's Prayer meme that we saw earlier, uh, this scene and its main line were both called classics. Um, Hassan Riyad here plays the role of a court chamberlain in 12th to 13th century Egypt, uh, who was blinded by the treacherous Mongols, and who now wanders around the streets of Cairo, crying out the name of his long-lost protégé and the rightful heiress to the throne, uh, who is called Gehed. Um, so he walks around the streets in the movie aimlessly shouting, 
uh, where are you Gehed and Tifania Gehed, um, as you see right here. And the meme substitutes Gehed, right, with Genehet, which means Egyptian pounds, uh, but it kind of almost sounds the same, right? Now, these memes uh, play on a juxtaposition between classic movies and the everyday issues faced by salaried workers today. Um, this juxtaposition happens through a visual reference to a classical film and a classical line, um, and it serves to exaggerate the emotional impact of the joke, right? It's almost saying that losing your salary at the end of the month is like losing your sister or <laughs> looking around for a long lost child, which is obviously ridiculous. Um, so what more do these comics show us than just this? If we go back to what I've said in introduction, I think it shows us two things. First, um, it shows how an ordinary, everyday aspect of online Egyptian social life, like memes, can be quite complex artifacts. Um, a competent user would just take a few seconds to get these jokes and react as they're scrolling through these memes. Um, but it actually takes a lot of visual competence and referential knowledge um, to understand the joke and to situate it in a broader social and political context. So memes are an excellent illustration of how an image can compress multiple levels of analysis into a single snapshot. Um, the second thing I think it's important uh, is that these comics show how a medium as new as internet memes um, relies on older media forms to make sense. Um, and maybe memes aren't so new anymore, but they're definitely newer than radio and television. Um, the whole point behind comics is to recycle films, uh, songs, televised plays, and so on, and give them new meaning um, uh, in a new context, in the case of Mandoop Tube, to complain about how one's salary doesn't even last the full month, right? So um, to summarize just very briefly, I hope to have shown how diverse social media use can be in Egypt, um, and by extension across the Middle East, if you read through uh, your suggested readings. I've talked briefly about blogging, about YouTube sermons and memes as different avatars of online life in Egypt, just to give you a sense of social media use beyond uh, popular mobilization or the Arab revolutions. Um, I also hope to have shown how this use extends media practices uh, that long precede the internet as such, right? Blogs intervene within an already existing news ecology of mainstream newspapers and satellite television. They often directly engage with them. Um, older models of Islamic authority are mediated in a different manner on YouTube, um, and memes remediate uh, popular cinema, theater, and song to create new jokes, uh, new digital caricatures. These kinds of remediation are central to the history of so-called new media in the Middle East because they show how new media are part of broader historical continuities and incorporate this history into their very form. So I wanted to leave you on this insight. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed these lectures so far. Uh, and uh, I will see you next week.